coming this afternoon for our United States Congressman Lee Zeldin's town hall meeting. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to start off, talk a little bit about the format if we can. We have a series of questions that everybody has sent in to us. We have roughly about an hour, ladies and gentlemen, in order to accomplish. There are a series of meetings that the Congressman is doing today, so we are going to do our best to try to address as many questions as, as we have and uh, to give them uh, your responses. I want to thank Suffolk Community College, our President Sean McKay, our Dean here at the Riverhead Campus, Mary Reese, we're joined by one of our executive assistants, uh, Chris Adams. They've been very gracious in making the facility available for us this afternoon. Good education for all our uh, uh, folks uh, out here in uh, South County. Uh, we have a couple of elected officials that are with us. Uh, before I introduce uh, Congressman Zeldin, are we going to uh, get him in and then we'll introduce uh, Councilman Dunleavy, I guess, for our uh, kickoff for the uh, salute to the flag. Okay, on that happy note, it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce our second term United States Congressman from the 1st District, Lee Zeldin. Let's do it. Some of our uh, uh, issues overseas. 
All right, well, first I just wanted to uh, start off by thanking you all for coming out. Uh, really uh, says a lot that this room is filled to capacity with so many people who care so deeply about our community and our country. Uh, we live in the greatest congressional district in the country. I truly believe that. We live in the greatest country in the world. And we have the greatest service members and veterans, which is why I feel like we are so truly blessed to be right here, right now. Uh, there will always be a lot of issues that will be worth discussing. Uh, I'm someone who's willing to work with anyone, wherever you can possibly find common ground. I've asked rooms, uh, take a guess, last Congress, Republican Congress, Democratic President, how many bills would you say have been passed by the Republican Congress and signed by the Democratic President? You know what answer I get most often? Zero. There were over 300 bills last Congress in 2015 and 2016. They included bills like the five-year fully funded infrastructure bill, the 21st Century Cures Act, the a reauthorization of the Zadroga Act for our 9-11 first responders. Overhauling the sustainable growth rate to improve Medicare. There was the education bill that was passed, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. I believe that the strength of our community and our country is when we work together. I am looking forward to being here. I'm really excited to be here, believe it or not, uh, to be able to answer as many questions that you have, despite our differences. Russia. I look forward uh, to the conversation uh, that we're going to have all day. I'm going to go from here to Farmingville, from Farmingville to Smithtown for similar events. Uh, first, I wanted to just briefly touch on some local issues. Plum Island was a piece of legislation passed the House last year. We're re uh, reintroducing the bill. In order for this legislation to become law, it has to get passed by the Senate as well and then signed by uh, the President in order to become law. Uh, Plum Island is a beautiful treasure that you feel like you're thousands of miles away from home when you go to visit it. Um, with the seals on the rocks and the waters hitting the bluffs, uh, reversing that federal law should be an important priority that all of us can work together on. Reauthorizing and fully funding our National Estuary Program is critical. We have two estuaries of national significance in the first congressional district, the Long Island Sound Estuary and the Peconic Estuary. The Sea Grant program was also, uh, is also something that's important, I think, for us here in this particular congressional district. That I've also signed a letter, a bipartisan letter, to make sure that that's funded. Well, now the Sound program is one that should not only be funded at its current levels, but it actually should be increased. Sir, could you answer some questions, island, please? Uh, so, fortunately, in the final version of the uh, FIMP, when you go
go from the draft GRR to the final version. What I've been told by the Army Corps of Engineers is that they're going to be including additional sand and a larger area, which is great and something that this district, I know especially the East End, cares a lot about and we've been working on. We care about climate change. So if there's, well, let me, okay, do me a favor. I, I, I'm going, I'm about to answer a whole lot of questions really quickly. But they're not our questions. No, you listen to yourself. Yeah, let him just finish, and then we're going to get into it, all right? Prom I trust well, you. We can read about this stuff. I'm a college professor, and I take questions from my students. Do any of my I'm going to write down. I'm going to write down. Okay. Okay. Here's my question. Set a good example for your students. Yes, free speech. By two ways, does that mean that I'm going to be able to speak no. as well? We can do questions, just answer. Ask questions. Answer our questions. Okay, so, um, you know, so there are a lot of important issues locally that I, uh, that we care a lot about. Foreign affairs issues, and I'm looking forward to getting to domestic issues related to healthcare, tax reform, our education, infrastructure, we have a lot to discuss. I apologize for those of you who are unhappy with the four and a half minute version and you prefer the three and a half minute version of an opening, but please go ahead with your, uh, your questions and I look forward to answering uh, our questions today. Thank you all for allowing me to give a full uh, introduction. Very kind of you all. Okay, so Congressman, here's the first question. We're gonna do this one in about 30 seconds or less. What criteria are you using to select questions today? Did the congressman give you a list of topics to select from? No. As a matter of fact, I have a fistful of questions here. No pre-selected topic. That's the first one. Um, I have a question from, and ladies and gentlemen, some of these are uh, statements, so I'm gonna to try to get the question out of it. You have a reputation as a fiscal conservative. Uh, how do you justify um, Trump budget actions, Trump budget acting, busting policies regarding tax cuts, infrastructure, and an 80 billion wall. I guess it's a, a question about the fiscal stability and the fiscal status of the country right now and where the administration might be and where you stand. No, that's an interpretation of the question. Yeah. That wasn't the question. Well, we're going to let him answer about the fiscal there, status. Listen, there's, uh, there are many different uh, areas of that particular question, so let me just answer um, a few different components of that. Um, first off, the, the budget process starts um, with out of the House of Representatives. The appropriations process does not start by the President of the United States putting forward what is a policy statement that we saw a few weeks ago. The, the president, and in my opening, I was talking about National Asteroid Program, Long Island Sound Program, Sea Grant. These are examples, and Department of Energy is another one. There are examples where you saw proposed cuts in the president's uh, budget policy statement, uh, which I oppose. The president, uh, but the process starts out of the, the House of Representatives on the issues that we care about. Infrastructure, uh, so, okay, so the, the government is funded where you have to fund the government this particular week coming up. Following that, the fiscal year actually starts at the end of September. So there's two different parts of this. One is the continuing resolution being negotiated right now. So some aspects of what was discussed, like for example, infrastructure, all the talk about an infrastructure bill is more part of the appropriations process for the next fiscal year that starts at the end of September. However, with regards to the wall as one part of that particular question, that's something that's part of the negotiations right now. Now, as far as our border goes, I'm stationed in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, uh, right on the Mexican border. We have a 9,000 foot wall at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, called the Huachuca Mountains. In Texas, you already have a barrier between the United States and Mexico, we have water. There are areas where we already have a physical barrier between our two countries. We have other aspects of our physical barrier that have vulnerabilities. 
Uh, I don't believe that we should have a, you know, a 30 foot wall over the top of the 9,000 foot high Wachuca Mountains. But this is, and this isn't just about people, it's also about narcotics. For me, when you, when you look at this issue as it relates to what is entering our country, we have a huge issue right here in our country with heroin and opioid abuse. Part of what the negotiation will be this week as it relates to the continuing resolution may include what to do as far as our border. But I'm, I care a lot more than just a sound bite to see what exactly the proposal is, but I do want to share some thoughts as to what some of my observations were as it relates to the southern border. The, um, as far as our state of our, our fiscal situation, we're approaching a $20 trillion debt. We have hundreds of billions of dollars of a deficit. We don't have a dot-com bubble like what we saw in, in the 90s. And what, what else we can't do is just be so, um, you're trying to be so, uh, so much of a fiscal hawk where you're trying to, you know, like just eliminate the deficit in one year. There's no way to do that without causing a ton of pain that none of us would accept as far as what's appropriate as far as delivering for the American people. But what we should be doing is looking seven, eight, nine, ten years out in our budgeting to put our government on a path towards being fiscally solvent. Uh, so as far as our, our budget goes, the continuing resolution, the number might be somewhere around $1.1 trillion, give or take, it's being negotiated this week. And as far as what happens at the end of the fiscal year, that's an appropriations process taking place over the course of the next several months until the end of September. Uh, some of the issues this week, some of the issues that we'll see play out in the appropriations. But how do you uh, stand? Let's stay on that for a second because the very next question talks about a couple of other items that actually would be appropriations items. This is a request to not reduce Social Security and Medicare benefits and a request not to defund Planned Parenthood. <laughs> debates and their, and their other exchanges, um, no, no one was really uh, putting any type of proposals on the board as it relates to uh, any of those. If you are on Social Security, uh, if you're on Social Security uh, and you're living in the first congressional district or you are on Medicare and you're, you have a local provider, the, the, there needs to be more of a factoring in of our cost of living because a Social Security payment, if you live in the 1st Congressional District, does not go as far here as it would if you live somewhere where the cost of living is a lot less. If, if, you, can, if you really make things right, one of the best fixes, in my opinion, is if it wasn't, uh, if the, the cost, the formula, the allocation wasn't the way it was right now, and instead, people who are our seniors, because we must honor that promise and commitment as made to them. They paid into the system, and for those who are uh, retired or close to retirement, we have to ensure that that promise is absolutely kept. But going even further than that, uh, I believe strongly uh, that we should be factoring how much more it costs us to survive on Long Island because we're losing our seniors. My family has moved almost entirely down to, uh, to far. We all have stories of our families being torn apart, going to North Carolina, um, South Carolina, Florida. You know, it's, it certainly has impacted all of us. Could you talk to Planned one Parenthood? More, one more on the appropriations, and this is something that's much closer here. Could you talk to Planned Parenthood? Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. Sorry. Just let me answer the question. You're not. He's trying to. One second. He was about to talk about Planned Parenthood. Let him answer. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, with regards to a Planned Parenthood, uh, that might be part of the continuing resolution this week. What's important to note is what that the bill doesn't, doesn't it, it, you know, a lot of people say like defunding Planned Parenthood as if that money is going to the Treasury. That's, that's not what the proposal is. Uh, we have six community health centers in the first congressional district. 
And they actually, as a result of the proposal of what, of what has passed, and I can't speak for a bill that doesn't yet exist, but what has passed, and what it often gets completely lost in this entire debate, is that the, the six community health centers, you have three Planned Parenthood centers, you have six community health centers. The community health centers, as a result of this proposal, end up getting more. There are more money that gets driven towards uh, women's health care as a result of that funding proposal, but all that's been discussed with it uh, has been as if you're just cutting the money and it's going to, uh, it's going to the Treasury. So, um, you know, we'll, I, I've supported the proposals uh, in the past. Uh, we'll see what it looks like. Representative, respectful. It's important that it's going from, it, it's not just going back to the Treasury, it's actually going towards. Representative, the respectfully so, speaking, any doctor's ma office ma can only handle so many patients. Let's go to this one specifically about Southampton Hospital expansion. Plans are partially funded through an agreement between the Cuomo administration and the Obama administration. Will this funding be jeopardized by changes to the health care act? I have a fistful of questions about the health care act. Yeah. So I guess we have a specific item regarding Southampton Hospital, but then many, many questions on a broader level about the affordable uh, health care. Well, uh, as it relates to our local hospitals, uh, something that's really important to, uh, to note is that under the ACA, there's something called the Disproportionate Share Hospital, the DISH payment cuts. That was one of the ways that the ACA was trying to pay for its proposal is that it included these DISH payment cuts. Uh, as we've gone through over the course of the last few months, there have been talks about how proposals to repeal the ACA would result in a dish cut. That's actually not accurate. If we didn't do anything, the dish cuts under the ACA the bill in effect. So what does that mean? For all of our hospitals all around Long Island, Southampton is one, Stony Brook is certainly a, a big one. If we do nothing, these hospitals end up getting those same cuts. Um, so when we're talking about what to do as far as healthcare in this country, we just, we all collectively should be oriented on the fight for not having the dish cuts go into effect because that is that is the largest source of what everyone is, is upset about uh, as it relates to uh, direct reduction of payments made uh, towards hospitals. What are dish cuts? Well, again, I, we're talking about a lot of questions as far as where we're going with that. We, we have another budget question that actually goes to yet another large entity here in the district, Congressman, and it's about the Department of Energy spending reduction by 20% regarding Brookhaven National Lab. I know that you've been there and have been a supporter of a number of issues there. Do you have any particular thoughts on that one? Yeah, the President had proposed a significant cut towards the Department of Energy. Um, it was in that budget blueprint, that policy statement that I referenced earlier. Uh, I oppose that proposal. The, um, the lab does important work. The lab, the lab does important work there. Um, they have, um, you know, not just Brookhaven National Lab, but Stony, SUNY Stony Brook as well. Uh, we have some other entities on a much smaller level receiving some of the funding. Um, it's just something that we need to fight parochially, um, across party lines to ensure that the final version of what actually gets funded doesn't include uh, what the president had proposed as far as a reduction towards uh, the, uh, uh, towards the Department of Energy and Brookhaven National Lab. Okay, uh, let's, um, this next question actually is from student from Stony Brook. Actually, I'm a grad there myself back in 79. A bridge to nowhere, it really was a bridge to nowhere. I have met many fellow grad students, colleagues, etc., from Muslim majority countries, including from Iran. Travel bans are obviously intended to discriminate against Muslims and have no good security justification. Will you rescind your support of a travel ban? Important 
uh, is that when you are executing something uh, as a complex as what that was, it's important that all of your federal employees, just, just let me answer. <laughs> it's okay if you disagree with my answer, just give me an opportunity to answer. Um, the, the, when, you, when, you roll out, uh, when you roll out something like these executive orders, you have to war game how you do it, which means that your federal employees responsible for implementing your executive order need to have all of their questions answered in order to be able to do it effectively, because if they, you don't agree with that? <laughs> what happens is you end up with, with a federal employee not properly implementing the executive order. Um, and uh, it's also important that if you're traveling that you know whether or not anything that's proposed can possibly impact your own travel. So the original rollout was uh, deeply flawed. Let him finish, folks, please. <laughs> so as far as as far as the uh, as far as the, the travel restriction goes, uh, I'm on record. I so su I support it. I was not happy with the original rollout. Um, I, I don't believe whatsoever that it's a targeting uh, of individuals. Uh, so based on that. function constitutionally of our government to provide for our national defense. And we have a new president who wanted to gain an understanding and control over our vetting process. Uh, <laughs> it's complicated. He wanted, he wanted to gain a better understanding of our vetting process. This was something that he campaigned on. Uh, and okay. something that he campaigned on. Let him finish, folks. And uh, it, it's, you know, when, over the course of the last Congress, we had the FBI director, the director of national intelligence, the, NF, the uh, director of Homeland Security. Uh, these are people who are part of the last administration concerned about flaws that existed within our vetting process. When you come from a country that is a destabilized country, you have what, what you would like to do, ideally, when you're vetting someone, is that you're able to rely on two different things, documentation or interrogation. Ideally, when you do vetting, those are the two main things that you look at. But when someone's coming from Syria, which has been going through it like a 30-way civil war over the course of years, over the course of, you know, what happens over the course of years is that when you want to get documentation to verify someone is who they say they are, and that they believe what they say they believe in, and you don't have the documentation to back it up, you end up having to rely more heavily on interrogation to make up for a lot, a lack you're not allowed to ask them what they believe in. So, that's also a part of the, the re well actually, okay, so again, I'm referencing uh, a concern on the part of the prior administration, um, which is a concern that I, that I, folks, please, let him finish. You guys, if you, if you prefer to answer your own questions, that's not We would like you to answer them, but you're just going on about it and not answering them. All right, let's move on to another topic, ladies and gentlemen. And Congressman, this is one that combines two very poignant issues for us right now. Uh, this is just a statement, and it's about substance abuse, veteran access to preventative and rehabilitative care. Substance abuse and the opioid epidemic here in Suffolk County, you know, has been something that is on everybody's mind. I see t-shirts here. And you being a veteran, know in particular about the challenges for veterans. What can you tell us about that? So uh, with regards to the substance abuse piece, and I, I personally have been to too many wakes myself. We're a very young, uh, young men, young women. Uh, just yesterday, there was a, a walk uh, that took place in Mount Sinai to raise uh, more awareness here in Suffolk, we have uh, some of the highest rates uh, that you'll see in the state, but this is an issue that impacts all of us all throughout the country. I'm a member of a bipartisan task force to, co to combat the heroin opioid abuse epidemic. I've been involved in this issue since my time in the state senate. There's multiple, there's, there's so many different aspects of this question. 
Uh, one is uh, the need for education, prevention, rehabilitation, treatment. It's great if you have access and training you know, to Narcan, but if you save someone and you don't get some of the help they need, then you're gonna have another Narcan save a few hours later. Part of what we need to do is educating you know, parents and having that access for first responders, that, that is very important. Um, it's inside of our schools. I mean, my, my daughters you know, are, are in a district where they start their health classes. My daughters are uh, 10, 10 years old, they're in fifth grade. They start their classes on health a little bit later than you know, the Free Village School District where I think they start their health classes in like first grade. A uh, part of this is, is in our classrooms. Part of it is with insurance companies to make sure that that when someone reaches their cap, that they are still get, uh, they, they're still able to get access to the coverage that they need. They, you shouldn't require someone to fail in order to be able to go inpatient because failure when you have an addiction oftentimes means death. Um, there's an, another aspect of this that I don't, don't want to minimize all this other stuff which is so important, but I do meet with FBI, DEA, to talk about you know, their issues with the illegal narcotics coming into our country, the need for certain laws to change so that they can have additional access for um, additional tools available to be able to prosecute. When we are communicating with other countries and we are asking other countries not to send their illegal narcotics to our country, you know what their response is? Uh, stop, you, you, they, they tell us that you need to have your people to uh, stop buying them. And there is, but there's part of this uh, though is the law enforcement component uh, as well. Uh, there were several dozen uh, bills that were passed um, up in up in Albany. Part of this is you know to reduce doctor shopping, uh, which is an issue not just in New York but around our country. Uh, encouraging people we know to get rid of our expired, unused, um, unwanted medications filling our cabinet. I just had a meeting in Peconic with a woman who opened up a temporary cooler that she, that because she had lost her 28 year old daughter and inside of that cooler were all different kinds of prescription meds that her doctor had wrongfully, had, I believe, wrongfully diagnosed uh, and, and prescribed to her and she, she was on so much, it was all in her medicine cabinet when she had passed away. Her mother um, is, you know, was deeply concerned that one particular prescription that her doctor had given her had actually directly contributed to her choosing to commit suicide. Um, so it's important that we, uh, you know, that you are able to eliminate, you're, you're able to eliminate uh, doctor shopping as much as possible, um, but you also have pharmacies uh, that are under investigation right here in our district. That component of the law enforcement uh, effort I, I'm sorry, there's just a lot of components to it. I, Why can't we ask our own questions? I have a heroin addict as a son, and I would like to ask a question. Ma'am, you know what? If you feel out of I'll be happy to read it.
maybe not all of you voted for Donald Trump. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, um, I, I, uh, I didn't vote for Barack Obama, but he was my president.
cards that talk about um, a concealed carry reciprocity act. Uh, some talk about, I guess, uh, concealed carry with back and forth with the state. Concealed carry reciprocity, H.R. 38. Allows anyone with concealed carry gun permit from any state to carry the gun anywhere, including on skilled school grounds in schools. And I have a couple of other cards similar to that. So I guess there's questions about your stance on it. What are you going to do? So I'm a co-sponsor. I'm a co-sponsor of uh, the Concealed Carry Reciprocity uh, Act. Oh! oh.
know, as people talk about legal immigration, illegal immigration, uh, part of the debates is all the different visa programs, what all the caps uh, should look like. Um, you know, but their main, their main issue is make sure they're getting their applications uh, done in time, which is something that we've been heavily involved with. Okay. Um, going through the cards, we have a lot of questions about Russian involvement. Let me read one. Are you concerned about the Russian interference in our election? Do you support the idea of an independent 9 11 style investigation? I am on the, I'm the opposite party of the, the DCCC, the DNC, John Podesta, but besides that, um, completely aside from that, uh, we're, we're Americans. Yeah, and nice. cybersecurity is an important issue that impacts all of us. Any one of us in this room can become a victim um, of cyber attacks. And it's important that we are able to do uh, our part. And we as Americans should be all concerned about what had happened as far as the targeting of the DCCC, the DNC, uh, and John Podesta, just from an American security standpoint. The, um, so to, you know, my short answer to that part is, you know, am I concerned about it? Yes. Uh, should it be investigated? Absolutely. What often gets missed in this, you know, this effort for having an independent commission uh, is the fact that I mean, I've, I've sat down with the directors of the FBI, CIA, DNI, and NSA about active investigations that they have going on right now. Uh, and I have a whole lot of faith in, in if, if you don't have faith in all of them, uh, you know, tell me which ones of those people. Uh, so the, the, the FBI, CIA, DNI, and NSA is pretty darn uh, independent. Now, as far as Congress goes, um, you, you know, it should be noted that um, you know, like Devin Nunes, over a year ago, was saying that the largest uh, the largest intel mistake that we made since Sun 11 was not knowing the plans and intentions of Vladimir Putin. That was coming from Devin Nunes. Uh, I look at Russia as our adversary. I believe that Vladimir Putin wants to be Vladimir the Great. He thinks he's eight feet tall. He'd like to put the USSR back together. He meddles where we had troops in harm's way. Uh, I, I give you Afghanistan, Syria, I can give you all sorts of uh, different examples or, or you know, the way that they spent last week, four nights of last week, uh, four days, nights of last week, flying uh, in airspace close to uh, our coast. Um, Vladimir Putin acts with a long game. He thinks 15 to 20 moves out. I was critical of President Obama's foreign policy as it relates to Russia. I'm critical of President Trump's. I've, I've been critical of President Trump's foreign policy as it relates to Russia as well. You can approach it with a smile on your face, or you can approach Vladimir Putin trying to, to be the bad guy. You have to have a long game if you want to if you want to win, because they are thinking 15 to 20 steps ahead. But it's most, I, 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 again, you know, aside from the congressional, aside from the congressional investigation that's taking. to NIH, uh, NIH, um, you know, it, it, we all are familiar with the well-known diseases. You know, we, we all have impacts in our family of cancer and, and, and ALS and, and MS and, uh, you know, I, I actually, but Parkinson's and I'm just naming, these are all illnesses like in my immediate family, you know, just between, you know, grandparents and, uh, and close aunts and uncles. Um, it's in all of our families, but there's also the rare diseases. Uh, and the rare diseases don't often get enough attention. And the money that gets in 
vested by the, the federal government, you, the taxpayer, that goes towards uh, NIH and some of these missions, uh, it's important not only for finding the cures as it relates to uh, some of the major illnesses that are all impacting our families, but it's also important in finding the cures to rare diseases. As far as this appropriations process goes, I've again signed on to a letter uh, to encourage uh, that full investment into NIH as I have in the past with signing those letters as well as being a co-sponsor of the 21st Century Cures Act. By the way, as it relates to any way that our tax dollars get spent, uh, I am all for absolutely any way to make sure that they are operating and being spent as efficiently as possible. There's a lot of, there's a lot of waste, there's a lot of waste in the way uh, our tax dollars get, sent, get spent. I, as your, uh, as you're a member of Congress, or whether, as well as uh, you know, as well as your your representatives at other levels of government, when you send tax dollars to that level of government, I think it's an important responsibility on the part of uh, that legislator, those legislators, and that executive at that level of government to be good stewards uh, of your money. Okay, Congressman, here's one that's actually probably very poignant for being in an educational institution that has premier programs throughout our county, especially in the hard science and the healthcare delivery. I know about that personally. This is actually an invitation for you. I would like to invite you to speak to SALLY. It's an acronym, Science Advocacy for Long Island, mm -hmm. representing young scientists at SUNY, BHL, uh, CHS, and the Feinstein Institute. Of, 15 new biomed startups from these institutions, only three stayed on Long Island, according to an online white paper. So I guess it's, we're nurturing our young people, our scientists, they're starting to get going, but maybe they look elsewhere once they, they're up and running. But the invite is there from yeah, somebody you. in the audience. Yeah, and I, I have um, two people from uh, our team. There's Nicole here. Where's Okay, she always the next one. So Bill, um, Bill just raised his hand. So whoever just asked that question, can, I, did. I can mention it to um, Sorry, there uh, is. Bill. Back. Thank you for the invite. You know, as far as uh, our scientists uh, here, I mean, we have an important mission and a long, rich history uh, on, in the first congressional district. Uh, as it relates to our scientists, um, there's a heavy investment that gets made in Brookhaven National Lab, SUNY Stony Brook, you go further out, Cold Spring Harbor, we have uh, a research mission that takes place at Plum Island. Um, our, our young scientists are unable to start their careers here because of the amount of money that they may be making here versus in other places. The cost of living is so much higher. We also need to invest more into our STEM programs that exist at both uh, the grade school level as, as well as uh, the, the higher education level. Um, science, te technology, engineering, mathematics. The STEM programs uh, are important to exposing our young children towards other aspects uh, of an education because um, you know, in many cases, and we see it with like, a, a common core model that I, just, I personally don't agree with whatsoever, but a one size fits, a fits all approach towards education, uh, one of the best ways to, you know, as, as an example to break through that is looking at uh, the STEM model uh, to help expose our young grade school students and higher, higher ed students, but also if they choose the field of science, to create additional opportunities, uh, it's important that they have the ability to make a living here, survive here, buy their first home, uh, and start their family. Uh, because I don't think a young scientist on Long Island who's inspired is going to want to have their first kid in the basement of mom and dad's house. Uh, and that's a big, um, you know, that's a big issue not just with the scientists but with both many others. Okay, Congressman, we'll be on three o'clock at this point.
here in general, regardless of what your background is, it would be great if, uh, if we didn't have anyone who was uninsured. And it's also important to note that even if you have health coverage, if you cannot afford your health coverage, you don't have access to it. Um, one of the uh, you know, parts of the CBO report uh, that, that had came out on, it's important to know the, the, the CBO report that came out on the American Health Care Act was just on the American Health Care Act. It did not factor in anything else related to um, anything that's within the power of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. It did not, uh, re it, it's not, nothing outside of budget reconciliation. So like the pieces of legislation that require 60 votes, reducing the cost of prescription drugs, making it easier for employers to pull policies, allowing policies to be sold across state lines, for reform, giving additional uh, flexibility to state governors on Medicaid, um, these are all examples of areas that require 60 votes in order to get passed. The CBO report was solely on the American Health Care Act. The CBO report uses a figure of 24 million people. They say 24 million more people than right now just on the American Health Care Act. Forget about anything else that can reduce premiums and deductibles, that can help the market. Just on the American Health Care Act, they say 24 million people than right now wouldn't have health insurance. What's important to note is that the CBO report says that the 24 million more people than current law would not have health insurance. What's important to, to note is that uh, the, the CBO report specifically references repeal of the individual mandate. There's a philosophical divide in this room between people who believe that there should be an individual mandate and people who don't. I am someone who does not, I do not believe that there should be an individual mandate. So the CBO report says that, as a, they say that is primarily due to, it's primarily due to um, individuals choosing not to uh, acquire health insurance because uh, they, because you're repealing the individual mandate. The, no, no, no. The, 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 yeah, well, actually, I started off with the answer that the that, that no well, for everyone the answer no one wants a number higher than zero. Like that's, I think, what everyone... But that's not how you 